Norio Kabenli and all the former residents of Rangalab live hundreds of miles away from here. They left more than 20 years ago, scattering throughout the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. Today, Norio and the others dream of coming back home to this island, not just for a one-day visit, but for good. <laughs> Millions have been spent to get rid of the deadly radiation on Rangalap, but no one lives here anymore. The newly built homes and the village church are empty. Norio and the others are still not sure if it's safe to live in Rangalap. If the nuclear cloud is finally lifted from what happened here 50 years ago. On March 1, 1954, young Norio and the people of Rongalap awoke to the blinding flash of the hydrogen bomb called Bravo. It was the most devastating explosion ever set off by the U.S. government, a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. Yeah, behind the outstanding, I was standing, looking to the west, I saw a blast. After 15 to 20 minutes, I saw a big cloud coming up from the west. And the color was yellow, red, and orange. After one hour, we all hear the sound coming from the west all the way to east. And that was a big sound, sound like a thunderstorm. Hours after the Bravo blast, a deadly cloud of radioactive debris fell from the sky. It was carried by winds across the Pacific, more than 100 miles from where Bravo exploded on Bikini Island. Tiny flakes that looked like snow suddenly covered this tropical island, burning the faces, skin, and hair of every Rongalap person in its wake. Soon, the entire population was evacuated to a U.S. military base, where their wounds were treated safely out of harm's way. One of the most badly scarred was Norio's 11-year-old brother, Hiroshi, who suffered radiation burns across his body. A military doctor named Robert Kennard tended that day to Hiroshi's injuries. Dr. Kennard would soon go to Brookhaven National Lab, where he'd head a team examining the health of those exposed to Bravo's radioactive fallout. Their research began as a secret military program and later moved to Brookhaven under contract to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. It would stay there for the next 43 years, all part of America's attempt to understand radiation's impact on humans in the event of nuclear war. In moving people off Rongelap, Doctors warned they should not be exposed to any more radiation for at least 12 years, if not the rest of their lives. But after only three years, the people returned home in 1957, assured by Brookhaven doctors that Rongelap was safe. In confidential memos, Brookhaven conceded the island was still more contaminated than any place on Earth. But the 250 people who returned wouldn't learn that fact until many years later. As part of an ongoing research study, Brookhaven viewed their homecoming as an opportunity to study radiation in the human body. A confidential memo spelled out their intent. The habitation of these people on the island will afford most valuable ecological radiation data on human beings. Exposing Rongelap's people to more radioactivity without their knowledge was a gamble the Americans were willing to take. Brookhaven's team traced the fallout as it made its way through the food chain and into the returning people, increasing the radioactivity in their bodies. Dr. Neil Palafox says the Rongelap people wanted to go home, but that Brookhaven should not have allowed them to do so until it was safe. This was a gamble. It was a gamble of uh, feeling that, well, maybe the amounts they would get wouldn't be so significant. There was significant risk there. They were in an environment and from an environment where you're concentrating in your body for many, many years, you're at risk. If this was my mother or father, would I move them back? I would say if you put that into the equation, none of the people would have been moved back. For the next 30 years, people were allowed to live on contaminated Rongelap despite a growing number of health problems that included increased cancer, thyroid tumors, birth defects, and growth retardation. You know, when these people were returned and resettled and lived until 1985, uh, the health of the people did not improve. In fact, you know, many uh, radiogenic related conditions uh, continue to exist uh, within the population. Patricia Worthington oversees health and safety for the U.S. Department of Energy, which owns Brookhaven National Lab. 
She says Brookhaven's mission was always about providing health care to the Marshallese affected by bomb radiation and not studying humans for research purposes. At the time that Brookhaven delivered the services for us, they were world class, they were uh, uh, recognized for their uh, expertise in the area of understanding of radiation, the health effects from radiation. They were liked by the Marshallese uh, and they were well respected. When asked about the memo that put people back on Rongelap 50 years ago, Worthington stressed the U.S. government did not consider it a human experiment. I'm not aware of anything that I could label that uh, either Brookhaven or DOE did that was wrong, but I, I believe that we are always forward-looking and forward-thinking about uh, how we can better um, you know, deliver the services to the people that we've been charged to serve and that we're privileged to serve. In April 2007, the Nuclear Claims Tribunal, a panel set up by the American and Marshallese governments, granted a billion-dollar judgment to Rongelap's people for damages caused by the fallout. The tribunal concluded people were put back on Rongelap for scientific research and military defense concerns, and that Brookhaven officials knew their island was still contaminated. One of the most insidious aspects of radiation is that you can't see it, you can't taste it. You can't touch it. It's there. It affects you in ways that aren't immediately apparent. And that was the environment, you know. <laughs> the levels of activity are higher than those found in other inhabited locations in the world. And we're putting you into that environment, into that location, so that we can see how the radioactivity moves from the soil, through the food, and into your bodies. Of course, they weren't being told that. But eventually they began to get a clue because the doctors kept coming every year. For Norio's family, the long-term impact of radiation was devastating. He takes special medication for a thyroid damaged by radiation and still has burns on his feet. His mother, his sister, and his wife all had their thyroids removed because of cancer concerns. Norio and many others believe the illnesses they have resulted from being put back on a contaminated island many years ago. Today, Norio Kabenli and the people of Rangalap still live in exile, unsure if they will ever go home. Questions about their cancers and thyroid disease remain unanswered. The battle over billions of dollars in compensation to be paid by American taxpayers is still going on. Fifty years after the Rangalap people were put back on their contaminated homeland, the fallout now continues for all those in its wake. Watching the atomic bomb in 1946 forever changed Robert Kennard's life. Here in the Marshall Islands, where 67 nuclear explosions took place over the next 12 years, Dr. Kennard joined America's study of radiation's effect on human beings. The bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki that ended World War II provided devastating evidence of radioactivity's lasting impact. Scientists tested animals to see what radiation from even bigger bombs would do as America's Cold War against the Soviet Union intensified. Let's face it, the threat of hydrogen bomb warfare is the greatest danger our nation has ever known. Enemy jet bombers carrying nuclear weapons can sweep over a variety of routes and drop bombs on any important target in the United States. Atom bombs were tested in Nevada's desert, but health concerns prevented larger hydrogen bomb explosions on American soil. In choosing the marshals, the U.S. military found an out-of-the-way place with only a few thousand people scattered on a string of small islands. By 1955, Kennard and two other doctors brought this study to Brookhaven National Lab, where it would stay for the next 43 years. My father, first and foremost, along with, with Dr. Cronkite and Dr. Bond, were doctors. And I believe, to this day, nothing could ever thwart that belief that they followed the Hippocratic Oath to the, to the nth degree, to the best that they possibly could. 
Under contract to the then U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, the Brookhaven team launched a long-term research study into the medical effects of radiation on the Marshallese. Brookhaven was an ideal place for such a study, a place where six Nobel Prizes would be won. Once a year, Kennard and a team of physicians and scientists would travel more than 10,000 miles to the Marshall Islands to see what changes had occurred. And for the next five decades, Brookhaven would remain in charge of understanding the consequences from the Bravo bomb blast and all that it would mean for humanity. Young, strong, and brave, John Anjing was the mayor of Ronglap when radioactive fallout from the 1954 Bravo blast rained down upon them. John liked Dr. Robert Kennard of Brookhaven and trusted him with the lives and health of those who lived there. In early 1957, John Anjing and a small group of Marshallese traveled to Chicago with Dr. Robert Kennard. There, the radioactivity in their bodies was tested. A newsreel of the time reflected the prevailing view about John Anjane and the other Marshallese exposed to the U.S. nuclear bomb tests. And to the AEC Argonne Labs in Chicago last week came seven men, natives of the Marshall Islands. These are fishing people, savages by our standards. John is mayor of Rungala, which is 100 miles from Bikini. So a cross-section, a delegation, was brought to Chicago for testing. The first was John the mayor of Rongalap Atoll. John, as we said, is a savage, but a happy, amenable savage. His grandfather ran almost naked on his coral atoll. The white man brought money and religion. John reads, knows about God, and is a pretty good mayor. The Iron Room is a radiation detector for human beings. Inside, a crystal to catch the radiation. Outside, an oscilloscope to watch it. One dot, one gamma ray. When the ritual of the Iron Room was over for John, it began for the others, until one by one they had all gone through it. As each finished, he was told it was over, and he was given apples and other good things to eat. And the seven men put on the suits and top coats they had been lent in Hawaii, which they would return in Hawaii on their way back to the islands of Uterik and Majuro in Rongalap Atoll, in the Marshall Islands, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, where hardly anybody lived. Elliot Billiard was a child when Bravo's radiation spread across Rongola. He was then too young to understand the Brookhaven doctors who said the bomb's fallout probably wouldn't affect his long-term health. By the early 1960s, Brookhaven realized their assessment was wrong. The radioactivity had so damaged Elliot's thyroid that it stunted his growth. As part of their study, Brookhaven took photos of Elliot and other children who did not grow normally and published them in medical articles. Nearly every Rongelap young person exposed to U.S. nuclear testing suffered thyroid problems. They are now well into middle age. What started out as a few cases soon became many, a clear warning that radioactivity had impacted the Marshallese more than Brookhaven had ever anticipated. Brookhaven decided those with thyroid nodules should have them removed to avoid the possibility of cancer. Over the next three decades, about 100 Marshallese would have all or parts of their thyroids removed. To gain their cooperation, Kennard arranged for each thyroid patient to receive $25,000 from the U.S. government. Many of the mostly poor Marshallese patients were told that they would die from cancer if they didn't take the money and agree to the surgery. One of those given little choice was the brother of Rongelap's mayor, James Matayoshi. They just told him that if he had the operation, they'll give him 25000 and he had received it. My understanding is some of the patients were told, um, if you don't get this, you're going to die. Certainly, that's not informed consent. If it was seen by the patient, I get $25,000 if I'm going to do a surgery that if I don't get, I'm going to die, certainly that's extremely heavy-handed. For those with their thyroids taken out, one of the lasting consequences was being placed on a synthetic hormone treatment called Synthroid, which had to be taken daily for the rest of their lives. In the 1970s, the manufacturer of Synthroid sponsored a film about Brookhaven's study in the Marshall Islands. The star of this film was Dr. Robert Kennard. Synthroid. Synthroid? Yeah, uh -huh. Synthroid. Uh -huh. uh, did you take Synthroid? 
the hive. I still have one one CD, one bill CD. Lekic was 17, the son of Vranglev's mayor John Anjin, when he came to Long Island among a group of Marshallese scheduled to have their damaged thyroids removed. As part of that trip, Dr. Kennard took them into Manhattan to see the sights. He even invited Lekic and others to his house in Setauket along Conscience Bay. A few years later, in 1972, Lekic died of leukemia from the radiation he had absorbed. Rongelep had suffered birth defects, cancer, thyroid disease, and other problems linked to the radioactive debris from the Bravo bomb. But nothing convinced him of the ongoing health threat, as did this young man's death. Lekic's death shattered his father, John Anjain, seen here in the 1985 Australian documentary. Rongelep's mayor would never again trust his friend, Dr. Kennard, and his assurances their island was safe. Privately, Dr. Kennard wondered about his public assurances of Rongelap's safety. He even ate coconuts from Rongelap to see just how much radioactivity would be left in his own body. I think that Dad was not completely satisfied with the results of the data, and he probably felt the only way to come up with a proper set of data would have been to create a controlled situation in which he would put himself in line with the other people that had been exposed and then study his own body. 20 years after being returned to their contaminated island, the people of Rongelap didn't know whether to believe Brookhaven anymore. Meetings between them grew tense as worrisome health and safety information, kept secret for years, was now revealed. I've asked the magistrate to call this meeting so that we could greet you and introduce to you the members of the medical team. Those who once trusted Dr. Kennard the most, like Mayor John Anjain, no longer did. Uncle John was devastated for losing his son. His death brought sadness to all the islanders here. My Uncle John was angry because he was a leader at the time and he felt that he had not lost his son only, but he also lost a member of his community. Bikini had been evacuated since 1946, when this atoll became ground zero for many of the 67 U.S. nuclear explosions in the Pacific. Bombs like the 1954 Bravo blast created huge craters and sprayed radiation more than 100 miles away. Despite cancer, thyroid, and other health problems in Rongelap, the American government returned Bikinians to their island in the 1970s after a cleanup. Now, at long last, these people will be returned to their homes and the uh, village will be rebuilt for them and uh, new uh, coconut and pandanus trees are being planted. They should have a very fine village and good life on the island when they return. In this film taken at the time, Dr. Kennard assured that it was safe to return to Bikini, just as he once said about Rongola. The radiation levels on Bikini are so very slight and so many precautions taken to reduce the levels to extremely low amounts that there should not be any real hazard when these people are returned. We know from our experiences on Ranjalap that the low levels of radiation there that persisted in the soil after the fallout were insufficient to cause any hazard to the Ranjalap people and so I wouldn't expect that there would be any, uh, any hazard here. As soon as they heard Bikini was, in theory, safe to go back to again, they said, we're, we're on the next boat. We want to go back. After several Bikini families returned, Brookhaven discovered plutonium and other radioactive potential cancer causers in their urine samples. Yet no one in the U.S. government informed them of this danger. Dr. Conrad Kajrati was then a young physician hired by Brookhaven to deal with the health problems of the Marshallese. He remembers how the Bikinians were told not to worry about the radiation. I think I remember that there was um, a discussion about um, the issues about plutonium in the urine and the cesium. And I really questioned why they wouldn't disclose that information. 
Um, and if I remember correctly, they, they basically said they didn't feel it was important to disclose. After spending more than a year in the Marshalls, Kudrati let his bosses back on Long Island know that the people of Ronglap and neighboring Utrecht no longer believe their safety claims. The distrust the people have for Dr. Kennard developed because of the inconsistency when he stresses no problem exists, then at a later time an actual health problem arises. It's not hard to understand the people's point of view if you can drop all your American ideas and biases about medicine and try to see things through the eyes of someone living on a relatively isolated, primitive outer island. Their blood is taken, they are measured, and at times subjected to body scans. In the end, people say they are sent on their way with little or no explanation or medicine despite many complaints. Now, if an American was to go through this process each year for 20 years, would he also not consider himself a research subject, a type of guinea pig, if you will? In 1978, 10 years after they said it was okay to return to Bikini, Brookhaven and U.S. officials reversed themselves. Now, Bikinians were told they must all leave their homeland because radioactive levels in the ground were still too high. The people of Ronglap watched what happened on Bikini with great alarm. They concluded they couldn't stay on their island and decided to do something about it. School teacher Lemio Aban returned with her family to Rongelap in 1957, thinking it was safe. They believe the doctors. We will return there even if we don't like, but we have to follow what they said. But after nearly three decades living on a contaminated island, Lemio came to a different conclusion, especially after she had her thyroid removed because of the radiation. I feel that we were being examined like the bikini because, because they compare us with the other expos. We feel that they are not really tell us what is the truth. John Anjane found it hard to be publicly critical of his old friend, Dr. Kennard. But John's brother, Jetton Anjane, didn't believe Brookhaven's safety assurances and was willing to say so. At a village meeting, Jetton told Rongelap's people that it was too dangerous to stay. Our general, maybe he met some of the Queen Bees. He came and made a meeting with us. We have to move from Ronglap. In 1985, some 350 people from Rongelap fled their homeland in a ship called the Rainbow Warrior, provided by the environmental group Greenpeace. They dismantled their homes and brought them with them to a new island hundreds of miles away. This exodus embarrassed the American government and shocked those at Brookhaven who were overseeing their medical care. We had just been there a few months before, and I certainly wasn't aware that there was anything imminent like a, a move to uh, Majado. We first heard about it back at Brookhaven, and uh, Kennard, I know, was shocked about it and thought it was a mistake. I think Greenpeace sold them a bill of goods, and uh, that overrode what uh, Brookhaven said. The Rangla people would now become nuclear nomads, exiled from their own homeland. Their mass departure forced a new round of tests that showed unacceptably high levels of lingering radioactivity in the ground, enough to warrant a costly cleanup paid for by American taxpayers. Lemio and her neighbors weren't sure when or if they would ever return home again. We cried because we didn't know and we'll be back. But the more important thing is we knew that there are still predators in there, so we said maybe it is better for us to live. John Anjane waited years for this moment. In 1954, when the Bravo bomb covered his island in radioactive fallout, he was a young, energetic man with dark hair. Now in 2001, he was 80 years old and needed a cane to reach the witness stand. At this hearing, Anjane explained what Ronglap was once like, before the blast, before all the people were forced to move away. The Ronglap people's case before the Nuclear Claims Tribunal took nearly two decades to decide. The tribunal was set up in the 1980s by both the U.S. government and the newly created Republic of the Marshall Islands as a way of independently reviewing the compensation claims for nuclear damage. Bill Graham is Ronglap's public advocate. He spent years putting together Rongelap's arguments before the tribunal, 
After reviewing hundreds of records, Graham came to his own conclusions. From the wrong left people's point of view, they were every bit the same as the mice or the guinea pigs that scientists were willing to subject to exposures in order to study the effects. In legal papers, Graham underlined how radiation had spoiled their land and how 30 years of living on a contaminated island had hurt their health. He called numerous witnesses to testify, including Catherine Chile, who returned to Ranglap in 1957 and in her testimony blamed radiation for her children's birth defects. <laughs> In April 2007, Rongelap's long-running case was finally decided by the Nuclear Claims Tribunal, which awarded $1 billion in damages. The tribunal ruled that 250 people had been returned in 1957, even though the U.S. knew Rongelap was still contaminated. As the tribunal said, the people came to feel like guinea pigs, used for experimentation by the U.S. I think Brookhaven was in a very um, a difficult uh, position. Like on the one hand, they were treating physicians, and on the other hand, they were investigators. Is that your patient, or is it a subject in an experiment? John Onjane didn't live long enough to see the decision in favor of Ronglap. He died in 2004, wondering why his friends at Brookhaven had betrayed him. In 2001, the same year as this tribunal hearing, Dr. Robert Kennard died. The man most associated with Brookhaven's 43 years in the Marshall Islands had spent the last years of his life explaining his actions. The neighbors never really knew what Dad did in the Marshall Islands. They knew that he was a physician and that he worked at Brookhaven Lab. It was not one of those things that was readily discussed. What am I missing here? You know, I'm not... There's something that there's something not right about all of this. Uh, you know, I've I never followed it. I never really paid too much attention to it. Uh, but now, I'm starting to to pick up on. I'm seeing all this litigation and why is this and why was this decision made? All I want is the truth out, whatever the truth is. Constitution Day, May 1st, is Independence Day for the people of the Marshall Islands. Many living here in the capital city of Majro are nuclear nomads, exiled from their islands because of radiation from U.S. nuclear testing. The people of Ronglep, who fled here 25 years ago, have yet to go home. Rongi, Rongi, let's go! Here, 400 miles from their homeland, Ronglep's exiles have struggled to maintain their own identity to keep a sense of what it means to be Rangalapese. <laughs> In downtown Majuro, the government of Rangalap has built its own town hall. It's a place where the air conditioning provides a welcome relief from the tropical sun outside. Here, residents have a chance to socialize with friends and talk about their children and they can take care of official business, such as picking up their government checks. They even use a ham radio to keep in touch with loved ones who live on neighboring islands. Several families live in a community called Rangi Town, built as a place to live until they can finally go home. Well, in 1996, when we started our resettlement program, the first thing we wanted to do was build houses for the exposed population. It gives them a sense of uh, settle and convenience, having these temporary housing uh, here in Majuro. Good morning. Life for the church-going people of the Marshall Islands has been defined by the lasting impact of radiation, which spread much further than Brookhaven ever suggested. A 2004 study by the National Cancer Institute blamed radiation 
for as many as 530 excess cancers among the Marshall Islanders who were touched by nuclear fallout. Bomb survivors like Lejean Englin say they have tried to forgive, if not forget, what happened to them. I don't get mad with the United States government, even though I know what they're doing was very, very wrong to the Marshallese. For Rongelap's new generation, Brookhaven is now part of the nuclear history they learn in classrooms. Out of the atomic ashes, the Marshallese have created their own infant nation, their own independence. Their currency is still the U.S. dollar, and they look to America for hope and a sense of freedom. But they have also learned to care for themselves, to speak up for their rights and dignity, and to rely on their own doctors for their health. The older people of the Marshalls still look out at the ocean and talk about the paradise-like islands where they once lived. The young people have heard of the fallout and the hidden threat of radiation that their elders call the poison. And they both wonder if it may carry unknown consequences for their own children, the next generation of Marshallese. For all the pain and suffering of the past, this new generation has forged its own independence, carrying on with the knowledge that life can change in an instant, in the flash of an atom.